Good afternoon, everyone. I am James Preston. First question, hands up. Regardless if it's the 1970s, 1980s, or 2005 series, who are the Battlestar Galactica fans? Good. So the three videos in this presentation might actually make some sense to you guys. I don't know about the rest. If you came just to this presentation for Battlestar Galactic references, there's only three. I'm really sorry. There's one Starship Troopers one at the end as well, if that works. We'll see what happens. Um, so I'm James Preston, previously of the Queen's College uh, out in Oxford. I now work for a security consultancy, Boo. No? Some of you people we work with, so hopefully a good thing. Um, first, 22 second video, let's see if everything works. Oh, no audio. Let's make sure I got my mic done. Come on, play some sound. Okay. So when people think about hacking, they usually think about something like this, right? Evil Cylon Raider, our network. wirelessly breaking into a trillion, race. whatever it's going to be. Battlestar, and they're breaking through firewalls, and that's how hacking looks like, yes? No, 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 no. Come on, Battlestar Galactica, we can do better than that. Threat actors make their way into networks by exploiting valid accounts. They go on to Intelligence X, a brilliant website. It's one of the many freely available sources out there that with your .ac.uk addresses, you can actually sign up for and have a look at the slightly better, not quite fully featured version of it. And they can find valid usernames and passwords in plain text. Plug your own personal email address into there that you were using back in the 1990s and laugh at your old password because I can always guarantee it's in there, courtesy of some breach somewhere. They might find out-of-date web servers that you're publishing out to the internet. Remote code executions is a really good one inside there. Drop a nice web shell into it. Um, they might find your VPN service and just hop through with the valid accounts that you've got because you haven't quite gotten around to implementing MFA or even strong authentication on your VPN service yet. Maybe they're going to get lucky with a phishing attack, still the most common way to get inside a network, of course. And my new favorite mechanism, because it's what the Russians like to try and do, and then we point and laugh at them, supply chain compromise. So once they're inside a network, what are they going to do? They're going to use PowerShell command line tools to go and execute their mal malware. They're going to create scheduled tasks on your machines to become persistent, survive reboot, survive some tools that might not look at scheduled tasks as a potential threat. They're going to exploit that out-of-date version of Google Chrome that you've promised yourself you'll go and uninstall and just start using Edge but haven't got round to doing yet. They're going to perform network scans to go and find other vulnerable hosts inside your machines. And they're going to exploit the fact that you haven't turned off remote desktop services and RDS inside your organization for your unprivileged user accounts when accessing your servers because you haven't quite gotten around to putting your firewall into east-west mode yet. And to do this, they're going to need to destroy your logs. They're going to destroy any information which has any, any indication as to what they were doing when they're inside your network. The advantage for them destroying your logs is that once you've expunged them from your network because you got lucky and someone said, oh, my computer's behaving a bit odd. And you went, okay, that's fine. Let's just re-image it because that's the easiest way to fix the problem. You, you have no idea how they got in and they'll just do it again. Now they might start out using just a, a plain old HTTPS out to a known command and control server for command and control, but they, they might also use something novel like Slack. So if you haven't killed Slack inside your network with a network level firewall, that's one of the really nice mechanisms that I've seen recently for people to use as a command and control mechanism. And of course, because Google Drive is permitted for uploads inside your networks, they're going to go and exfiltrate the data, steal data, using the magic that is Google Drive. And their goals, mayhem, misery, early retirements of you guys. It's kind of an advantage, in fact, in some cases, I guess. Um, all the usual things. All the usual things. Now, wouldn't it be nice... If all this knowledge, all this information, the way that threat actors get inside networks, do malicious things, move laterally, was in one location. Well, of course it is. It's the topic of this presentation. This is not quite all of it because that very middle stream is just a little bit too long to fit nicely on this size projector. But this is the MITRE attack matrix. This is a universally accessible knowledge base of the real world ways that threat actors get inside networks and that once they're inside a network, what they're going to do to cause mayhem and misery. So by the end of this presentation, the idea is that you're going to be able to use this wonderful MITRE attack matrix to one, 
get a bit of an idea as to what your cybersecurity maturity is like at the moment. What are the areas that we're doing good in? What are the areas that we've got a chance in hell of detecting the threat actors? And even better, preventing them for exploiting our networks in the first place. Identify some areas for improvement. And also, this wonderful thing of emerging threats. So the National Cybersecurity Center, NCSC, the CISA organization out in the US, for instance, they go and publish advisories and they say, the latest cool name of a threat actor group today is going and launching these attacks against further and higher education. Go look out for them. And you can use the MITRE attack matrix and the knowledge which is published by these organizations to see well, what's your exposure to that group? What's your exposure to these naughty Russians that are out there that we want to go and bonk on the head? Please hold your questions to the end. Those of you who know me well know why. So MITRE, let, let's just build some legitimacy with the MITRE organization. So they're an American nonprofit uh, financed by the United States government. They give them lots of money and they go away and do research for things. One of those areas is indeed cybersecurity, but they work on a large number of other areas as well. For instance, healthcare and defense and all those wonderful things. They form this marvelous organization, the Center for Threat Informed Defense, along with some pretty big name organizations there. If you haven't bumped into the Center for Internet Security or CIS before, you can jump onto their website and they've got this wonderful kind of list of things. If you're doing all these things, you've got a pretty decent chance of defeating threat actors, detecting them early and expunging them from your networks before they get a chance to do anything too malicious. And they're really big on GitHub. They're, they're just every single tool that they can, they can publish out into GitHub, not only so that you can use them and freely access them, but also so you can put feedback into them. And they do listen to that feedback. It's absolutely marvelous. So attack is one of the things that they've kicked out. There is the, uh, the attack website, which displays the matrix that I've shown before. And there's also a service called the attack navigator, which allows you to interact with the data and put colored mappings and other comments and other useful information inside there. Now, the attack matrix itself is a selection of the tactics, techniques, and procedures. These you might see referenced in other organizations as TTPs. And indeed, we don't just apply these to cybersecurity, but we also apply them to defense and other organizations as well. Now, the tactics are the, those core things that a threat actor needs to do to be able to form their malicious acts inside your network. So one tactic might be they want to become persistent inside the network. They want to be able to survive a computer being rebooted inside your organization. The techniques is, well, what they're actually going to do to establish that tactic. So that might be they uh, go and use scheduled tasks as one mechanism. And then the procedure is the detail, the fine detail as to what they're actually going to do to exploit that technique. So go to command prompt, execute scheduled tasks, forward slash create, and go from there. So you get some really good information exactly what the threat actors have been seen doing. Now, this all then maps to their actions on objective. At the very end of the matrix is the impacts of things that might happen to your organizations. Uh, and there you can go and say, okay, well, ransomware is one of them, and denial of service is another one of the likes. Now, they, as far as they possibly can, link to public knowledge, knowledge bases of the known threat groups. Where do we suppose Cozy Bear is from? Russia, yay. Deep Panda. Chinese, yes, they're the best at stealing stuff, right? The Chinese made an entire plane by stealing stuff from the West. Brilliant website, Chinese stole stuff, made a plane. Go have a look at it and they'll be like, yeah, wings came from here, engines came from here, avionics came from here, all the stuff that Chinese did to go and steal it. Black Oasis, gone. Not just necessarily a country, more of a region. Yeah, so Middle East. Iran is one of the areas they've been linked to, but yes, predominantly the Middle East. So let's have a closer look. Yes, available in dark mode for those that like dark mode. You can also look at it in light mode for those that prefer a lighter display. Um, let's have a look at those top headings. Let's have a look at those tactics. The very first two, reconnaissance and resource development. Sometimes we somewhat ignore them because you know what? There's not very much that we can do about reconnaissance and resource development. That, that's purely for the threat actor to do. And we can actually filter those out when we come to scoring ourselves against these. There might be some things that we can do. So active scanning, you might say, okay, am I network firewall? If it detects someone doing a port scan against the public side of the firewall, it will go and block them. It might be things along the lines of, well, when you publish your job postings, if you say, okay, I need someone with a Fortigate experience, they can look at your job postings and say, oh, okay, when we attack these guys, we're probably gonna be up against a Fortigate firewall. So some links in there, but not necessarily things that we can 
really do much about. The first things that we can do about are going to be those initial access. How do they get that first foothold inside a network? How do they then execute malware? How do they become persistent inside the network? One of the things to bear in mind is not every one of these stages, not every one of these tactics is actually going to be relevant to every attack. So a low skilled attacker might just look to steal credentials and they'll stop at initial access and go no further. Some organizations might never even see the persistent phase, for instance, as well. As we progress through the attack, the attacker will then look to elevate privileges, gain access to administrative accounts is what they're really after, of course, evade defenses. How do we get around Sophos? How do we get around whatever we happen to be using? How do we gain access to more credentials? My favorite one here, passwords.xlsx, right? Really easy way to get hold of extra credentials. When you go back to your organizations on Monday, go to your file server, just type in passwords. Just, just do it, right? See if anyone, it might not necessarily be IT, and if it is IT, then well done. But if it's not IT, go and have a nice word of them. What are you keeping your passwords in an Excel document? Yes, it's probably safer than LastPass, but all the same, why are you keeping your passwords in an Excel document? Uh, discovery, so, so they've gained their foothold. They're now doing real stuff. Let's go find the file servers. Let's perform an Nmap scan. Let's do that stuff, and then let's move laterally. Let, let's go and RDP onto a server, for instance, because, you know, we were like, yeah, firewalls protect us from the internet. They don't protect us from ourselves. We never moved our firewall to east-west deployment. So, you know what? We, they can just RDP to wherever they like. Let's do that. Let's do that. Bad things, though, happen. How are they then going to collect information? They might just dump it in a single file server that they've set themselves. How do they perform command and control and exfiltration? The things to bear in mind when it comes to command and control and data exfiltration is that if you're not performing decryption on your firewall, you have a next to near no hope in hell of detecting the command and control and data exfiltration tactics that they're going to use, detect those techniques. And then finally, what impacts that they're going to have inside your organizations. Now, so far we've looked at the enterprise attack matrix. There are two others, perhaps not entirely relevant, depends on how things are set up in your organizations. There's a smaller one for mobile devices. And when we're thinking about mobile devices, we're thinking about Android, iOS, and the likes. We're not thinking about your Windows laptops, your Mac OS laptops, we're thinking of these specific devices. There's also another one for industrial control systems. So uh, all those American organizations that keep having their pipelines not taken offline, but just the billing system interrupted, so we must turn off the fuel. And hopefully, one day they'll have a look at the MITRE attack matrix and see how they can protect their industrial control systems as well. You can also filter it to specific platforms. So looking back at the enterprise attack matrix, if you've just interested in Office 365 and Azure AD, or perhaps if you're just interested in Windows and don't have any Macs, or perhaps you're really heavy into the Linux inside your organizations, you can filter to just the tactics and techniques and procedures which apply to the devices that you've got. So you can filter just those. So let's get going. Let, let, let's do some work. Uh, first, we're going to head to the TAC Navigator. Links, big slide at the end with all the links, so don't worry about writing them down at this stage. First thing, set your color theme light or dark, choose the enterprise attack matrix. And then if you want to filter out the pre-attack, that's the, uh, the initial reconnaissance and the resource development that threat actors are going to be doing, just untick that box and it will remove those two columns for you. So let, let's go find some information. We've got this wonderful knowledge base. Let's go do some learning. So we're going to start top left-hand corner with initial access, and we're going to look at drive-by compromise. You can then right-click on that and either have a look at the entire tactic in more detail or just have a look at the specific technique in more detail. Uh, that will pop up a new page. It will tell you a little bit more about that, what platforms might be affected, what user levels and permissions might be required to go and exploit this inside your organization and you can have a good read. And what you'll see throughout this entire knowledge base is there's lots of references. There's lots of, we saw this threat group do hit this. Here's a link to an article about them doing that. And in this case, we're given a, an example of how an attack might actually go down. You could read those examples and think, oh yeah, we've got that, that might stop it. Or we don't have that, that might be a problem for us. Maybe we've got the ability to detect but not necessarily prevent this form of an attack inside our organization. And we can just you know, work through that knowledge, learn that as we go. 
Next up, we've got the examples, and this is those links to those wonderful cozy Russians and those dragons and other things that might be happening outside in the world. Uh, links to the different threat groups. You can go and read about those threat groups as well. Again, this is all open source information. This is all things that we've learned that have been published publicly. I'm sure there's plenty more at knowledge out there in the uh, deep, dark depths of the uh, wonderful people in uh, a small donut-shaped building just up the road. Yeah, interesting people up there. Um, and we can see the mitigations. We can see the ways that we can prevent these techniques from being exploited in our organization. So in this case, one of those ways is restrict web-based content. Do URL filtering. Cut off ads if you're feeling really bold. Cut off access to known malicious websites with features that are probably built into your firewalls already. Exert control over browser plugins. That's one area that I'm really interested in at the moment. We've seen a, a sudden surge in malicious browser plugins that people go and install on their machines, and suddenly that browser plugin has access to all the resources of that browser. All the things that you might be copying and pasting between your password manager. All those Bitcoin addresses that we've seen recently in attack where someone pastes in their own Bitcoin address. But because the plugin intercepted that paste, it changed it for another one. The threat actor's address. Well done, that threat actor. Smart people. And of course, the ability to detect those threats as well. So mitigate wherever possible. Detect if you can't mitigate. So let's, let's do some work. Let's do some real work. Let's start painting by numbers. So we can take the mitre attack matrix. We can score ourselves against it. There's a couple of different ways that we might apply that scoring. So MITRE as an organization have got a, an article published on their website uh, along the notion of log analytics. So maybe we've got the ability to detect that threat because we're pulling in the right amount of information. We're actually analyzing the logs. Maybe we're pulling in the right amount of information but aren't analyzing the logs or maybe we just don't have that information in the first place. Now the way that I usually apply it on a sliding scale of we've got no ability to detect and prevent or we have the ability to fully detect and prevent the exploit of this tactic, uh, one other option there. You can also use the MITRE attack matrix when you're doing product evaluations. So you've got Fortigate in one hand, you've got Power, uh, or you've got PF Sense in another, and on your head you've got Palo Alto Networks balancing. You know, let, let, let's go and compare those different firewalls and those different vendors' coverage of the MITRE attack matrix with all the features turned on, including decryption, including decryption, uh, and see if that firewall is going to protect us against some gaps that we might have inside our organizations. Now, not all techniques have a method to detect and prevent exploit at this stage. Some of those are just facts of life because if we were to turn that off, the user might not be able to log into their computer and that would be a bad thing for the user. For IT and security, I'm sure a very good thing, of course. So to do that, we, we can go and set up a color scale. I usually work from the notion of one and red is bad, three and green is good. If you want to work one to five, if you want to put a blue color in there, by all means, there's loads of different ribbon bar options along the top of the matrix there for you to interact with, uh, color palette starting out with. Next, go and order it uh, based on the number scoring instead of the alphabet uh, for that uh, ordering inside your matrix and start scoring. Select a matrix, uh, select one of the tactics, select one of the techniques, have a read, have a learn, think about do you have the ability to detect and prevent or just the ability to prevent uh, or just the ability to detect and color accordingly. And then we end up with red. Bad. So let's have some inspirational words from Commander Adama, which if the audio works, it's great. How? Oh, no. Doesn't really matter now. One second. This is probably me. It Sorry, AV matter. guy. Should have tested more. Yes, I see the problem. Go back. She's Go back. No. Forwards. How? Oh, oh so bad. Doesn't really matter. Who remembers at the start of the first episode where Adam Adama goes, well, this sucks. We're at war. Well, we're at war. We, we, we've got all our threats. Better now. Uh, I'll, I'll drop the actual video into the recording. Don't worry about it. It'll all be good. So, so we end up with something that looks like this, maybe. Red is bad. No ability to detect and prevent. Green is good. Well done. You bought Sophos, and that's covered you the bit in the middle. 
You, you've got shiny, expensive next generation firewall that you've licensed to the hilt but not turned on decryption. Boo. Red, all red. Command and control, exfiltration, no chance. No chance. Maybe a little bit of DNS filtering might help. Some very sophisticated tax use DNS in their uh, methodologies, but um, yeah. Uh, and that ends up with impact. Four things that we can do nothing about there in blue. Three things that we've maybe got a chance. No, not none, none whatsoever. And uh, yeah, we're screwed. So let, let, let's go from there. Let's go from there. Let, let's export this. Let's take this color mapping that we've done and go and export it. Well, three different options for export. One is to JSON. Do that. Export to JSON, save the file somewhere because you can import it back into the attack navigator later and show improvement over time. Show what changes you've made to uh, better your organization. You can also export to Excel, which is absolutely brilliant because you then get that color mapping. You can save it as a PDF and you can take it into your next cybersecurity review with whoever it happens to be that you work with and say, look, bad stuff. Most people understand red means bad. You might have to explain the blue. Green means good. And you can then say, yes, I need this money more, thousands of pounds to go and turn more of the reds to yellow and green. Now, I mentioned the wonderful people at the National Cybersecurity Center and indeed CISA. Uh, so some examples from recent reports here that they've kicked out. Uh, so APT27, APT30, uh, other different organizations. How do we actually see what the impact of one of those organizations would be inside our organization if they said, right, you, we're after you. Well, let, let's take our completed matrix and start to work through it with uh, a couple of button pushes. So there in the selection controls, we're going to hit the padlock drop down option. We're going to say select sub techniques with parents, sometimes turned on by, by default. Just, just tick that box and you're good to go. Hit the search button, and under techniques, go to select all. And then there is a disable all button, which appears under technique controls. That disables all the techniques. We're then going to go back to selection controls, press the diselect button. Go to threat groups then in the search box and find the threat group that you're most interested in that time. In this case, I'm going to go and press select next to cobalt group. So we're interested in what the cobalt group might be able to perform against our organization. Select that disable enable button again, and then hit the show only enabled filter, the I button there. That will then take your matrix of all the different tactics and techniques and procedures and filter it down to the ones that the Cobalt group have been seen using in the past. So you can say this bad group of whatever they happen to be, Martians for all I know, this is what they're going to be able to do against our network. This is the state of our defenses against that organization. And this is our ability to detect or prevent them. Now, I was originally then going to talk about my six areas, which I, I'm really quite interested in. But uh, then this happened. <laughs> Let's do a case study. So uh, Linus Media Group. Uh, decided to uh, not secure their credentials properly and uh, other things. And, uh, and Linus went and published a video earlier this morning. If you haven't already seen it, I was uh, sitting on the coach watching it on the way over here thinking, oh, drat, I've got to re-engineer part of my presentation. Um, they run a YouTube channel, if you're not already aware. And uh, overnight, basically crypto scammers broke into their YouTube channel using a very specific exploit, uh, started publishing videos about Elon Musk doing his musky like things, um, and started to deface the channel. So how would that look in the MITRE attack matrix? If we were a YouTube channel and we came across this attack, what would that look for us? Well, based on the publicly available information so far, this is the way that I see it. So initial access, exploit for public facing application, that was YouTube, right? That, that was their Google account. That was their ability to log in to that public facing service. Now, the relevant bit for here that I, I think of when I think of the Oxford Colleges and the Cambridge Colleges and the departments in between as well, is how many services do you have published to the internet where the back end server then has unrestricted access to the rest of your infrastructure? How many out-of-date WordPress sites do you have where if the threat actor were to drop a reverse shell onto that machine, 
through a plugin that hasn't been updated because the JCR IT officer forgot to do so when they were prompted, how much scope would that threat actor then have if they were on that machine? Would they be able to perform a port scan? Would they be able to listen to authentication traffic as it comes in and out of that machine? And would they then be able to move laterally within that network? Uh, there seems to be some element of a trusted relationship and phishing involved in what, as well. So uh, I believe it was something along the lines of a prospective sponsor got in touch, delivered them a malware affected PDF and said, please, please, please run this PDF and have a look at our terms and conditions. And that, of course, then leads us on to the execution phase. So user execution was required. These are one of the areas where we can think of, well, anti-malware probably detected it, but it sounds like no one was listening to the alerts. When it comes to the user execution, we've got an element of training that we can do there with the user. Please don't open PDFs from people that we might not necessarily be expecting or have never worked with in the past. Or maybe we could look at even earlier defenses in the sense that our mail filtering service, whenever it sees a Word document, whenever it receives a PDF, it takes that document, strips out all of the active content and gives you a newly printed PDF with no active content in it whatsoever and says, here's what it looks like. If you want to have access to the active content, let IT know and they can release the original version of the document. Obviously not something we can necessarily easily do inside Oxford and Cambridge because we don't always control our mail filtering as much as we would like to. So exploit uh, for client execution. So in this case, it then sounds like they use some form of an exploit, perhaps against Google Chrome, uh, to go and steal session cookies. They stole uh, an identity that was already authenticated from the browser, took that session cookie, dropped it onto another machine, and the moment they did that, they have the same level of access permissions as that user from anywhere on the planet. And Linus in his video actually states, well, why was YouTube, why was Google allowing a session cookie to be taken off one machine, put on another machine, which might have been halfway around the planet, and still be allowed access to that service? Why didn't they look at the IP address and said, suddenly you're, you're, well, you started in Canada and now you're in Uzbekistan? Now, that, that's a problem. That, that's not what's happening. That's not what we want. And of course, the impact, uh, they lost some data. They've recovered it. Well done. Uh, they manipulated their YouTube channel. They defaced the YouTube channel. They made it harder for them to recover the system because they had that session cookie and so were able to continue logging in and continue accessing the site and they removed access to the account when YouTube went, oh, that's bad, uh, we'll, dis we'll disable your account. So uh, originally I had these wonderful six things that I was going to talk about, uh, and I've decided, okay, let's take one of them at least, because you know, I've got to do some work here. Uh, late stage attack. So a late stage attack, the threat actor, is likely to exfiltrate data over a web service. And that might be to a cloud storage thing like Google Drive. That might be sending up to uh, GitHub, for instance. I've seen people use Adobe Creative Cloud quite prominently, actually. And uh, the, one of the only ways that we can help defend against this is uh, a web service provider commonly use SSL and TLS encryption, giving adversaries an added level of protection. If I don't need to say it again, but web service providers commonly use SSL, TLS, giving adversaries an added level of protection. And if I were really going full Admiral Adomer on you, I'd be saying, oh, so say we all to this, yes. But please, please, please start doing decryption. If you value those final stages of the attack as a problem to you, if you go, we don't like the notion that command and control might be a threat in our organization. We don't like that data exfiltration is a threat to our organization. We need to do some decryption. Now for that, if all you do is start with your servers, your servers don't have users logging into them, right? There is no good reason for that to be a problem. In particular, the servers which have access from the internet inbound to them, your web servers, your RDS servers, your VPN servers, perform outbound decryption from those services, and indeed, for your servers, limit their access to the internet as much as you possibly can. When it comes to clients, you know what, if you really want to have a discussion about it, I'll be here at the end of the presentation. So, what now? It's time to do some education. We've got this wonderfully colored matrix. We know what the bad things are that might happen to our organization. Red mean bad, 
Green means good. Go and take it to the senior leadership of your college. Go and take it to senior leadership of your department or other institution and say, I would like money to make red green. Is that okay? Next, remediate and mitigate. When it comes to deciding what's going to be first, have a look at which of those columns you have the most red in. Which of those columns might you get the most benefit from by just doing a little bit of decryption or anything else to go and detect those threat actors? Some organizations might have very good early stage defenses. Perhaps you've got really good phishing simulation training. Perhaps you've got MFA on every one of your web portals. Perhaps you don't have any public facing services other than your VPN, which requires a security certificate that's embedded inside the trusted platform module of your laptops to be able to connect to that VPN. And you can say, you know what? The first stages, we're really good. Maybe the only way that someone could do anything in the first stage is sneak in a USB memory stick and plug it into your computers. And if so, great, well done. But we've still got those later stages. A really sophisticated attacker will still find a way. Life will find a way. Oh, one second, no, that's uh, Jurassic Park. Ignore that. So then you have a look at the mid stages. In particular, the bit which really strikes me is that reconnaissance stage. Nmap scans are very noisy. Place your firewalls such that you have your clients on one side, your servers on the other side, and if they detect an Nmap scan, they go, ah, an Nmap scan! And please follow up with their detections in a timely manner, unlike Linus Media Group. Show improvement over time. Really, really handy because green means good, red means bad, and oh look, here's the original version. Here's us. A year later, 20,000 pounds later, there is more green, hurrah. By which point the MITRE organization has probably updated the attack matrix and added additional areas for you to look at, but don't worry about it. And consider using attack in your product evaluations as well. PF sense red, Fortigate yellow, Palo Alto networks, green. I'm not biased. I just say I'm all powerful. So, um, this gives me the shivers every time I see the Pegasus rocking up. I go, oh, everything's going to be great. Our friends have arrived. Unfortunately, our friend. Oh, I'm getting shivers right now. Oh, it's really an awesome sight. You know, like, like double drive pods, double ability to launch four times. Oh, it's just so awesome. So awesome. So, um, your friends will sometimes become your enemies. In some fact, it's even better to become your own enemy. And by performing what you might even call red teaming inside your organization, you can educate yourself as to how do your defenses perform. When a threat actor performs an Nmap scan, what does the triggering of that scan look like in Sophos? What does that look like on your firewall? One tool that you can use to help perform that adversary simulation, that red teaming, is known as MITRE Caldera. Really easy tool to get installed onto a Linux box. Takes a little bit of faffing, to be honest, to actually get it to work the way that you like, but it might map straight to the MITRE attack matrix and gives you ready-made tools to go and perform non-destructive, but still very informative actions against your machines to say, how does it look? Now, if that sounds like too much work, we can play a game. There is this marvelous company that I follow religiously out in the United States called Black Hills Information Security. Uh, they've come up with this marvelous card game called Backdoors and Breaches, which you can use in your teams to educate yourselves against the tactics, techniques, procedures, and educate yourselves against the methods of initial compromise, Pivot and Escalate, C2 and Xfil and Persistence. Um, I was really hoping to have a couple of decks of this available. Unfortunately, they haven't arrived in time from shipping. Uh, they do now ship to the United Kingdom. If you're really interested and will take a business card off me, I might even... I don't actually have any business cards. That might be a problem. Oh, well. Um, if you're really interested, I'll, I'll actually be quite happy to send you a copy of that, uh, so long as you'll take an email address. Mm -hmm. um, this you can play interactively on the web, of course. Uh, play it with your teams. There's a really good rule guide on it. There's a really good demonstration video as to how it works. Uh, you can use it to educate yourselves on that initial access, pivot and escalate, C2 and XFIL, 
and persistence inside a network. So supply chain compromise, let's just look at the one at the bottom. Uh, so in this case, uh, you've been shipped an update for a piece of software that you expect. Uh, the threat actors, just as they did with SolarWinds, managed to sneak in a malicious vector inside that application update. Now you're infected by uh, the SolarGate uh, series of malware. SMB weaknesses, perhaps you haven't gone and applied the Microsoft security baseline inside your organization and still have SMB version one turned on. Yay, want to cry. Oh, look, HTTPS is XFIL. What are we going to do to prevent HTTPS is XFIL? Decrypt. Please decrypt. Uh, an event triggered malware. So in this case, we might be able to evade a sandbox. Uh, evade something which spins up the malware inside an isolated environment because it was event triggered. It waited until a specific time before it actually started performing malicious actions. Oh, look, Starship Troopers. So, uh, any questions? Come up in a minute. We'll, we'll come around to questions in a minute. Uh, plenty of links there. This is the first slide to go and take photos of. There's another copy of this up in a second or two. Um, the uh, recording and presentation for this myworldofit.net, uh, so long as everything has worked correctly, uh, I'll go and get that online within the next 24 hours. Give you a second. There we go. Um, so I'm not just James, your friendly InfoSec practitioner. I'm also James, your friendly InfoSec practitioner who works for a company called AN Security. Uh, we operate out of Basingstoke, really strong presence in Oxford. One day I'll make the trip up all those wonderful roundabouts and get to Cambridge. Um, oh, Milton Keynes is the worst. Almost as bad as Swindon. Uh, those of you who are from Oxford and listen to Jack FM will understand why. So uh, we offer security services. Uh, one of those things is a security review. So uh, we can go through various frameworks with you and say, this bad, this good. Look, here's the MITRE attack matrix. Uh, advisory and audit services. Penetration testing I love. Um, let's go and break into things. Penetration tests are different from vulnerability assessments. If you get a Nessus scan report, you have not had a penetration test. You have had a vulnerability assessment and you were probably scammed in the process if you paid more than a couple of thousand pounds for it. Um, Cyber Essentials and Cyber Essentials Plus, the NCSC have finally realized that we can't control the academic staff and are managing that a little bit better. So if you do want to work towards an accreditation such as Cyber Essentials and Cyber Essentials Plus, you can get in touch with us. Uh, infrastructure, ah, oh, ruckus. You marvelous shipper of no goods for another year or so. But still, they have this wonderful technology called Ruckus Calpath, which allows us to give your students a personal pre-shared key that is unique to them, which is then dropped into their own isolated VLAN so they can use all the services that might work over MDNS. They can stream to their own TVs, for instance. And finally, if you really don't like looking at your firewall, we can do it for you. And we can do it really well because we're paranoid as hell. Splinter Cell, brilliant game, used to love it. So um, that slide again, uh, jp at myworldofit.net. If you have any questions for me as James Preston, your friendly InfoSec guy, jpreston at ansecurity.com. If you have any questions for me as James Preston, your friendly InfoSec guy who works for AN Security. I will now take at least five questions, so long as they are relevant to the presentation and not relevant to Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> On the condition that you take one of my flyers, you can also have either a security key by Ubico or, if I have enough, a uh, YubiKey 5 NFC with USB-C attachment. Go on. Please, do it. Good. Okay. Um, that applies to servers as well, yes or no? Uh, Where there is no interactive login by any user ever. Excellent. We can exclude that and we can also prove it to them and show how they can test for it. Right. Okay. Um, so whenever you perform decryption, you create a root certificate authority. You then create a signing certificate, drop it on the firewall and say to the firewall, 
sign decrypted traffic with this certificate. Then for your users, if they really want to go and see that if their traffic is being decrypted or not, they can look at the little padlock icon, click on that and see is it either, insert college name, dot decrypt and traffic certificate or Komodo or GoDaddy or whoever. Now, that's a little bit of a faff. You will also find on some firewalls that you can say, uh, pop a response page, pop a page that says, you're about to visit a banking website. We don't or we do decrypt this website. Don't decrypt banking websites, please. That that is a career limiting move. Don't decrypt healthcare and perhaps consider don't decrypting government as well. Um, and you can pop a page that says, we're about to decrypt this or we're not about to decrypt this. That there are ways and means around that. Come collect your YubiKey uh, over here, James. Any other questions? Go on. Oh, you had a good question earlier for the other guy. I, I can't wait. Go on, tell me. No worries. Yes? Cool. Brilliant. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So uh, how do you share the information? Uh, MISP. Have a look at the MISP project. Um, that MISP, uh, that is a open source intelligence sharing platform. Uh, and that is one mechanism to do it. Uh, after that, maybe consider doing your own write-up, publish it into whatever discussion forum you have. Even better, take the MITRE attack matrix and figure out which ones they used. You can then even give them the JSON export and say, hey, this is what they use. Go and import that into your own matrix and see how that compares. If that answers the first question, yeah. Um, se second question, what do we do about things like AnyDesk? There, I think it's more a case of let's go and limit the scope of the attackers as much as possible. So a modern application-aware firewall will have an identification process for any desk. It'll have an identification process uh, for Dropbox or you know other remote desktop and other file sharing tools, for instance. Yep. Yep. So, so, so a next generation firewall should have the ability to look at the traffic and go, even though that's not going to a cloud hosted instance that any desk themselves are running, and it's a cloud hosted instance by institution B, it should still be able to look at that traffic and go, oh, that's any desk, right? And it'll do that via application matching, you know, with decryption enabled, it can look inside the payloads and go, oh, this looks like any desk, for instance, or this looks like, uh, I'm struggling to think of remote desktop. Uh, this looks like ISL or Bomgar or something like that, for instance. And then through the firewall, you can say, these are the ones that we expect to use. These are the team viewers that the BMS guy uses to go and log into that one machine that's still running Windows 7. Uh, and you can say, they're allowed to use that on that machine, and that's great. And the other remote desktop services are disabled, for instance. At the very least there, you've reduced the scope of a threat actor actually being successful. After that, it's more a case of log analysis and other boring stuff, but it, you know, it works. Does that help you with the second question? Come collect your YubiKey. Um, I got three more, come on. Yes, very much. Uh, I personally use Bitwarden. Uh, I like their open, uh, no problem. I, I like their open, well, just their openness in the sense that they publish a ever so slightly redacted security review at least once a year. Their source code is available for public inspection uh, and you can host it yourself if you really want to. Um, so those who want a cloud hosted platform, I, I you know, would go with Bitwarden to be honest. Those who want a local one, KeyPass is still very good. You can even integrate it with the, the black YubiKeys as well um, with a challenge response uh, authentication mechanism as well, which is really quite handy for cutting out threat actors, you know, just stealing usernames and passwords, for instance. Does that help? Yeah, yeah cool. Um, come get your YubiKey. Uh, two more remaining, go on. Is the relevance of this 
Okay, I will. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Screen recording, all the good jazz, yeah. Um, a break glass mechanism is usually what we kind of look at. So, so one account which has like a 96 character password, which was generated on a security key and has sufficient access to, you know, gain access to other systems, for instance, is usually where we kind of look. Um, yes, a very difficult area to handle otherwise, but some form of a great break glass system. It, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Come collect a YubiKey. I've only got, oh no, I've got one of each type. Come on, one more left. If not, I take the remaining one home. And go on. Yes. I've just handed out four of them. <laughs> right? So, so, so uh, Yubico, I'm not, they're not sponsoring this, by the way, right? <laughs> I, I just went on to Amazon and expensed five YubiKeys, right? Uh, they have a hardware security module. Um, it, it would need support from the, the software, of course. Um, but you can store the private key on the hardware security module. It's then a physical representation of that identity. You can apply access control mechanisms to ensure that only sanctioned applications can access the key, for instance. Um, and then you have a physical representation of that key. You can then duplicate that, store another one in a safe or whatever makes you feel good and sleep well at night, for instance. So um, hardware security modules. Uh, the the keys I've been handing out wouldn't do that, but they have a, a very specific hardware security module. Uh, well, actually, no, these, these ones might be able to do it. Yeah, maybe. Uh, they have a very specific hardware security module, uh, which can fulfill that application, definitely. Uh, after that, you're looking at companies like Talis. Um, they, again, have hardware security modules and you know, protected routes and things like that that are really quite cool. So um, that's the other place to do it. Uh, come collect your remaining Yubi key, you get a 5C and FC. Uh, I have no more freebies. Would anyone else like to ask any other questions from there? Go on. Mm -hmm. So, so everyone, is, everyone is saying attackers are getting smarter, right? Not strictly true. There are two types of attackers. Casual attackers, they are not getting smarter. <laughs> they are maybe adapting with the times, but they're definitely not getting more intelligent. These are the ones who will go and steal credentials. Now, the marvelous thing is the casual attackers steal credentials, the determined attackers usually aren't interested in that. So the nice thing is if you can keep the casual attackers off your networks, there is a decent chance that unless someone wakes up in the morning and goes, you know what, I don't like them, there is a very small chance that you'd actually encounter them in the first place. Those determined attackers, unfortunately, they're now nation state Backed, courtesy of all the wonderful wars that we're currently having, and have unlimited budgets. They will continue to get better. But here's the reassuring thing. We're doing the same. We know what they're up to, and that's public. And those who really, really, really care about this stuff can unleash holy hell on them as well. It may not help you sleep well at night, but it does help me because I just like a good bit of revenge every now and again.
Um, so casual attackers not getting smarter, but definitely moving with the times. Determined attackers unlikely to encounter them if you can keep the casual ones out, uh, unless they decide, hey, we're going after you today. But they are definitely getting very much smarter because they're just really well funded. But we can exert the same on them as well, so don't worry about it too much. No. Okay, so yeah. So, so here's the thing. Um, Chat GPT is is nothing new. It, it's a it's a it's a natural language model. And you know what? Most of the cybersecurity and research organisations are already asking the same questions themselves and plugging that into their own defences. And uh, if any of you think, oh dear, my job is going to be obsolete, I asked it five very specific things about firewalls quite recently. Three of the things that it responded with were horribly out of date and would not apply. And two of them would probably have led to compromise of that organization when I asked it how to give me a zero trust configuration of a, uh, of a very specific file company that has blue boxes and then moved to silver and black boxes. But hey, um, Yes, I, I, I wouldn't worry about it too much, to be honest, simply because we, we're keeping pace. You know, Microsoft, I believe, already kicked out something which will detect an AI-generated image because it's going to be a problem. But we can build that into our defenses. So, you know, life goes on. Uh, we're probably out of time, but if anyone's got one last question, we're good to go with that. Yes, definitely. I like these presentations that we always go over. Uh, thank you for your time. If you would like a copy of Black Doors and Breaches, I, um, come up and give me an email address and I'll sort out sending you one in the not so distant future. But otherwise, we've got other places to be. So thank you for your time.